we'd like to share a special message from an entrepreneur. Let's watch this. Hi, I'm Ethan Brown, and I'm the founder and CEO of Beyond Meat. I want to express my tremendous admiration for each of you for reaching the level you have today and being able to compete in such a prestigious event. With 2,500 athletes coming from 50 different countries all throughout the world, this is truly a special event, and you don't get here without enormous amounts of dedication, hard work, and countless hours that nobody sees. As you gather in this winter environment, I wanted to call attention to one of the important things the world is facing. That is the crisis of climate change. We have an opportunity within the next several years to put everything we've got into trying to stop climate change from accelerating. In doing so, we can save winter sports, but it's important that we start today. And the reason that Beyond Meat is involved in the World University Games is we wanted to communicate this message that each and every individual can take a step today to make a change that will reduce the acceleration of climate change. One of the key things that people can do every day to help address climate change is to shift the protein at the center of their plate from animal protein to plant protein. And in doing so, we can dramatically reduce the level of greenhouse gas emissions entering the atmosphere on a daily basis. If you consider the Beyond Burger, we use 90% fewer emissions to put a burger at the center of your plate than a burger that comes from animals. We use 99% less water and we use about half the energy. The opportunity for all of us to come together and use food as a tool to fight climate change is real and it's urgent. And there's a point of convergence that I find very exciting, which is that athletes around the world are embracing plant-based meats and plant-based eating as a way to improve their competitive performance. So you can join top athletes, whether in the NFL or NBA or many other leagues around the world, that are utilizing a plant-based diet to reach even higher levels of performance. So there's something very interesting about this union between what's good for your body is also good for the earth and can help you compete at the highest level. Let's make sure that we continue to be able to do this. Let's take a stand against climate. And there's no generation that I believe in more than your generation. Being able to solve this issue, being able to put it front and center and take care of it in a way that's gonna sustain our planet, our opportunity to compete, our opportunity to get together. Congratulations on getting to this level and I wish you all the best in the upcoming games. Thank you. All right, that's a great message from Ethan Brown. Please, please give him a hand so he can hear that. There you go. All right, thank you, Ethan. And so our next panel will inspire us to support the innovators in our communities. I would first like to introduce our moderator for this panel, it's Kathleen Rogers, if you'll please come on up. We can give her a round of applause as she makes her way. So as the Earth Day, president of Earth Day Network, Kathleen Rogers has worked for more than 20 years as an environmental attorney and advocate, focusing on international and domestic environmental policy, public policy and law. Under her leadership, uh, EDN has developed a significant role in advancing the new green economy and has emerged as a dynamic year-round policy and activist organization. Joining her on stage, when I call your name, please come right on up, uh, Joe Dixon the CEO of Ducted Wind Turbines Incorporated, and a veteran entrepreneur who has served as a founder and or a senior C-level, hello sir, C-level executive of seven high-tech startup firms. Lots of experience there across multiple industry and technology sectors during a long 30-year career. Also joining the panel is Colin Wilson and Doug Lynch. Come on up, guys. <laughs> Businessmen and members of Eco Athletes. Hey guys, welcome, come on up. Afternoon. How are you? Okay, great. So Eco Athletes is an organization whose goal is to leverage their social power to engage millions of fans to take positive, meaningful climate action. So Ms. Rogers, it's all yours. Hey, is this one working? Yes. Very nice to meet you all. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my organization. Uh, in 1970, uh, I think the world have finally noticed that the Industrial Revolution had taken its toll. And two um, enterprising people, one a US senator and one a 19-year-old kid named Dennis Hayes, uh, created something called Earth Day. And about 20 million people came out on the streets on Earth Day, April 22nd. Um, it still remains the largest non-religious event that ever happened in the world. 20 million people in one country out on the streets. And it changed everything. Right after the first Earth Day, 
uh, almost all of our environmental laws were passed, starting with, believe it or not, environmental education, um, all the way through all of our toxic laws, Endangered Species Act, Clean Air, Clean Water, and an enormous number of other laws that were very complex and new to the American landscape. But it really helps clean up the planet. Um, the organization became global, and now we're in 192 countries with about a billion and a half people participating in Earth Day. And we focus year-round on plastics, which we'll address a little bit in our fashion conversation. Um, climate change, obviously, reforestation, and um, climate literacy. Those are our main topics. Um, I think we're here because most of us recognize that the um, well, the period we're facing, this new green revolution, really has it a long history, starting with the Industrial Revolution. Then we move to the Tech Revolution, and now the Green Revolution, where we don't just have this opportunity to remake the world because um, the new technologies are available, but because we have this climate imperative. We also have the plastics imperative. We have the biodiversity loss imperative. So what we're finding are people working worldwide not just for giant companies, although the people you heard in the right before us talking about um, renewable energy and other forms of energy that are making a big change, but because um, we have so many incredibly smart people around that are working so hard to do this. Um, one of the things, it's, um, it's a chance for everybody to own it. So I know the message of climate change, and earlier today there was a panel with some NPR people talking about how to talk about climate because it's been so negative, the sky is falling. But I'm one of those people who truly believes this is one of the greatest opportunities on Earth, not just for the wealthy countries, but for everybody. And we're gonna need all sorts of new actors and job uh, seekers are welcome into this community. We're gonna need, certainly need psychiatrists to deal with the outfall of climate change, but we're also gonna need artists and athletes and um, designers and architects and along with all the other science departments and in every single field. So we're really promoting that. Um, and just to give you an idea, and our theme for Earth Day worldwide, and we'll get billions and billions of hits um, around this theme because people are always looking for um, something to talk about on Earth Day, and it's called Invest in Our Planet. So um, part of the reason I'm here is to talk to the people that are really making personal investments with their lives, with their money, uh, making a difference. But right now, whether you're working in a garage like they did in the Industrial Revolution or in a big company, there is an opportunity to make billions of dollars. Already, we're investing billions, just the US government, with the um, what's called the IRA um, Act that was passed last year. And so we're seeing literally hundreds of billions of dollars, not just in the US, but worldwide, going into new technologies. And they range from, and I'll give you some ideas, uh, a vaccine for honeybees, which as you know, are pollinators. Uh, without them, we wouldn't be here. They pollinate our food. If the bees go, we're finished. And young people invented the beginnings of this bee vaccine, which is now being used um, and distributed worldwide. Uh, there's a huge interest in hydrogen, which I don't know if you're gonna be talking about that later, but uh, hydrogen is a, a very complicated new source of energy. The um, Webb uh, telescope that's now in space, you think that's about looking um, for the past uh, by looking in space, but really a huge part of their agenda is looking for new forms of energy. Uh, they are a new, great new um, uh, discovery that wax worms um, eat and print, can break down plastics. I mean, I'm hearing every day about young people, uh, people who've retired from other jobs, inventing things, being purchased by larger companies. So we're seeing this massive age of invention. Um, of course, there's vertical food growing and all sorts of other things that are happening. Um, so I'm pretty excited about what we're seeing um, that's happening. Of course, solar, the price of solar has come amazingly down. And um, so I think what you're gonna hear today are from people who, as I said, are putting their, their money, um, their lives, um, their enthusiasm and devotion into creating a new economy. So I'm gonna introduce you all together. Um, the first person I'd like to introduce is Joe Dixon. Um, we heard a little bit about who he is. Joe is currently the CEO of Ducted Wind Turbines and is a veteran entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur, who has served as the founder and senior executive of seven high-tech firms across multiple industries in his 30-year career. His first startup was a spin-off from, spin from GE, um, and since then he's been part of six other startups across all these industries, including advanced materials, IT, 
microelectronics, medical devices, and biotech, and raised lots of money uh, in venture and private equity capital, and has a lot of experience with mergers and acquisitions. He's an expert in financial modeling, market validation, and he is now um, running a company, Ducted Wind Turbines, and we'll hear from him in a minute. Doug Lynch is the co-founder and CEO of Zenkai Sports. Um, Doug is a 14-year pro hockey career, co-founder of CEO of Zenkai Sports, if I'm saying that right, and co-founder and advisor of SportShare Technologies, founder of DHL Hockey in China and Hong Kong, ambassador high impact athlete, athletes, member of Eco Athletes, and one for all athletic athlete leadership development. Um, a couple of things about him. Uh, one is that he is a vegan, and hope, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about that. Um, and of course, um, that many, as we just heard, many, many athletes are um, looking at this and becoming vegans. It's enhancing their, um, their own performances. And he also holds a record for, he has three brothers, um, most brothers who ever played on the same team in the same game, beating the famous Sutter brothers, who were three, I think, all together, um, who played in the same game on the same team. So that's very exciting. And he is also a um, very, very um, important person in my view because Earth Day runs a big global campaign on fast fashion and he's in the apparel industry, which is terrific. And Colin Wilson, uh, after 11 years in the NHL, he went back to Boston University, uh, received a degree in psychology, became fascinated with environment and climate change, thankfully, and uh, began to put his money where his mouth is, reallocating his investment portfolio to companies that help solve climate change. And he's an advocate for impact investing. So welcome to all of you. That was a long introduction. Um, so I thought what I'd do is pass the microphone to each of you. I guess we have enough. Um, and you could all tell the audience a little bit about how you moved from what you were doing in the past to your current um, enterprise. Do you want to start, Joe? Oh, I can. Sure. Go, Joe. Uh, thank you. Um, as, uh, as Kathleen just said, I started my career with GE. I never intended to be an entrepreneur, but uh, when a compelling technology, um, you start working with it and it finds an audience and it finds a marketplace, but the company you're working with does not want to exploit it, the only logical thing to do is to start a company. And so that's what I did back in uh, 1988, so I dated myself a little bit there. Um, since that time, I, um, that first company became very successful, as you said. And, uh, and I thought, well, gosh, this entrepreneurship thing is easy. And I, you know, I stepped to the plate and hit the first pitch out of the stadium, and that's, that's it. This is easy. I'll, I'll just do this again. And my next company was an internet company in 1999 that exploded fantastically <laughs> with the, uh, with, with, when, the, when the tech bubble burst. And since then, I've been with a number of other companies, but, and, and right now I'm with Ducted Wind Turbines, which I'm very uh, proud and privileged to be with. Um, I actually have two jobs. I work, I'm the CEO of Ducted Wind Turbines, but I'm also a NYSERDA EIR mentor for a number of different clean tech startups, and I have been for the last 12, 13 years. And so I've had the privilege and honor of mentoring probably dozens, if not, you know, 60 or 70 different high-tech, clean-tech firms uh, that are working to, uh, to solve the problem of climate change, to save winter in a variety of different technologies, like you just mentioned, from, you know, from waste management all the way to, you know, harnessing different e energy sources. Oh, sure, thank you. Uh, one clarification, I was vegan for about a year after I retired. But I'm now I'm a pescatarian, so just for the record, because if anybody's watching, we will out forgive there, you. Yeah, they'll be all over me. Um, no, thank you very much. Thanks to Kathleen for the uh, the awesome intro. So uh, I retired from professional ice hockey. Um, for me, is actually getting back to you know the Beyond Meats a gentleman spoke earlier, but uh, started recognizing what I was eating, how that was affecting the planet. That kind of took me down this this rabbit hole of what. I can do as an individual, and it sounds kind of daunting, like, okay, you recycle, drive an electric car, but like, what can I do? So for me, it was the diet thing first, and then started getting into the synthetics, the apparel, what the apparel industry is doing to our planet, um, with fast fashion, how you mentioned, and recognizing that all of us last you know, 20 years or so have grown up with synthetic apparel, and that set me on this kind of trajectory where met the right people at the right time, and I started an apparel company that uh, were eco-sustainable, cotton-based. We're the only performance company in the world that does cotton-based base layer for athletes, and uh, 
We have the world's greatest, uh, greatest technology in Philium, which is anti-odor, so it's less washing, uh, less pollutants running in the rivers, oceans, and streams. So recognizing that apparel literally touches every person every day, uh, it couldn't be a bigger you know, opportunity to go into, but also the biggest challenge. So we have an incredibly uh, long road ahead of us, and, but with Zenkai Sports and the team we've uh, surrounded ourselves with, we're ex extremely excited to hopefully be a, dis you know, everyone uses the word disruptor, but be a disruptor in the industry and, and getting people to recognize one day like, oh yeah, like I am wearing oil and I am wearing plastic. And right now people in the next generations want to know where their meat comes from, their eggs come from, is it sustainably farmed? And the same thing's happening now in apparel that people want to know where their apparel is coming from. They want something that's sustainable and they want a better option. So uh, I'm hoping I can be one of those advocates moving forward that at least people will recognize and maybe possibly uh, change what they're wearing because it's gonna uh, help the environment more in the future. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I guess I represent a different uh, portion um, of this subject. They're entrepreneurs, I guess I'm the, on the investor side. I, I went back to college, I wanted to go the psychology route, that's why I was mentioned, but in doing so, I also took two classes in climate, became more fascinated, had lots of uh, conversations with the professors, um, began reading Bill Gates, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, and recognized that what we were looking at was a, you know, a technological problem and an economic problem. Um, and so I wanted to go about solving that. At the time, I had been a part of effective altruism. Shout out to Sam Bakeman fried at FTX. He was he was involved in that, but um, so I was, I was donating. <laughs> That's a whole different conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, so I was donating money to Climate Air Task Force and Fire Environmental Defense Fund, uh, GFI.org, which um, you know, plant protein. So that was one way of going about it. But I get, I became more fascinated by learning economics, um, how to bring down costs. You mentioned, uh, um, you know, we're moving to solar, you know, due to it's you know, we all want to, but at the same time, it's more cost effective. Um, so I became fascinated with this. And the more research I did, realized that there's 140 publicly traded companies that are helping to solve decarbonization. Um, and, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a portfolio, which 58% of Americans are invested in the stock market at, the, at this time, um, to begin allocate, allocating my own money um, into these companies was a way of me feeling, feeling as though I could do more. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's just another layer um, of trying to solve this problem. Thank you. That, that, uh, pretty amazing careers, if you ask me, and, and particularly um, because, as I began to describe at the beginning, I really do feel that we're reimagining everything, whether it's the chairs we're sitting on or this room or how we get our, find our energy. Um, everything will be reinvented, and the world will look ex astonishingly different, knock on wood, uh, within the next 50 years. So I have a couple of questions about that. Um, the first is, um, you know, in every economic revolution, particularly the tech and the industrial revolution, the government worked hand in hand with corporations and um, even entrepreneurs um, to not just sell it to the public, but invested heavily in uh, making that happen. Sometimes for political reasons, in the industrial revolution, the US was terrified of whatever they were, iron boats that were sailing into the harbor. So they decided they um, needed to invest in new technologies. They actually created uh, the first mandatory education because the companies that were coming to them saying, hey, we can do this, um, didn't have educated workers. So that was the beginning of mandatory education in the United States, which I find fascinating. But now we're in the 21st century, the world's um, kind of crazy to say the least right now. And I'm wondering how um, each of you would describe the role of government, whether it's um, in regulating industries or providing incentives for any of your businesses. And so I'd love to hear your opinions and investments. What do you see the role of government? Get out of the way, help us out, and in which ways you think they could help your individual efforts? Joe, do you want to start again? Sure. Um so we are, uh, our company, uh, Dr. Wind Turbines, is a NYSERDA sponsored company. So we've taken advantage of many NYSERDA programs, uh, which is a state, agent, state um, energy agency here in New York. And, uh, and that's been extremely beneficial, not just to us, but to uh, dozens and dozens of other startups uh, throughout the state. Um, and so I think that, I, that <laughs> government's role is to definitely to guide and and to and to and to protect the public from from you know poor technologies and things like that um, but at the same time 
Um, capitalism got us into this mess and capitalism will get us out. And so uh, we absolutely need uh, the freedom of entrepreneurship and companies that can, that can be started and supported by a number of different government agencies. Um, there are uh, USDA programs and federal programs as well, um, ARPA and DARPA and all those, uh, and ARPA-E and ARPA-I um, are all government agencies that support all kinds of new innovation and um, and then that there's the whole SBIR and SDTR tracks too. So. so that's on the positive side, but have you also seen regulations um, or any government rules or laws that have impeded what you're trying to do? Have they been largely supportive? We actually run into them every day, putting up turbines, because, <laughs> because um, when you talk to somebody and you say, hey, we'd like to put a small wind turbine here, They'll say, oh, that's one of those 750 foot, you know, big things and they're noisy and they kill birds and they do this and that. So the perception of uh, that, that we have to change or that we have to go against is, is a lot. But on top of the perception are lots and lots of local regulations as far as height restrictions, as far as visual uh, restrictions and things like that. So and they vary. They vary across the entire continent from locality to locality. So there's no like state or federal mandate with regard to putting up a small wind turbine. I'm talking 40 to 60 feet, 12 feet in diameter. It's not a big, big machine, but it's capable of big power. So uh, yes, that is something that we run into and it's something that is going to have to change in order for us to be able to establish point of use electricity as David Sandbank and and Ken were talking earlier, um, around the country, this distributed energy is absolutely going to be needed um, in order to solve this problem. True confessions, before I was, you're probably not gonna like this, before I was with um, Earth Day, uh, I was the head of, I knew nothing about birds, but I was the director of migratory birds for National Audubon. And um, it was my uh, job to stop wind power plants in what we called important bird areas. And I actually was one of a couple people who coined the expression, you're gonna hate this, blender for birds. Uh, because at the time, the turbines were, the birds couldn't see them, and it was my job. So they were building them on Hawk Mountain. If you are familiar with Hawk Mountain, it's where millions of hawks migrate through. So, um, but I've come to love the wind profession and the wind uh, industry, and they've made huge strides in um, dealing with that issue. So happy about that. Okay, I'm gonna to skip to you. And so okay. as an investor, um, personal, what are you seeing out there and um, how can the government help or how is it hurting? Yeah, well, I'm sure it's been talked about throughout this day, or um, the IRA. I mean, it, it, so I guess it works twofold. One is it incentivizes entrepreneurs to go to the projects like decarbonizing cement, decarbonize, uh, making steel, which are very hard problems, uh, getting money into people creating, uh, you know, uh, new small modulator reactors for um, nuclear. I mean, these are tech that we need to incentivize people putting in money into it and the technology um, to get it to commercialization. So that's going to be that's one aspect of the IRA, and you know, it's a, it's a monumental 339 billion dollar bill um, that's meant to incentivize um, entrepreneurs. Uh, and the other aspect of it is again incentivizing companies to actually decarbonize because I mean at the moment some of these technologies there are in fact a green premium at the moment that you're paying for not necessarily wind and solar those costs have gotten down but um, but the IRA does something we need long duration energy storage so if you don't have the topography to have Hydro Quebec you need long duration energy storage in form of battery um, in 2023 you can now get 40 percent basically buying these uh, energy storage batteries it's 40% basically off the price tag, and that's because of the IRA. So um, I think it incentivizes in the right places. Obviously, there can be disputes on the bill and whether it went far enough or something like, you know, electric vehicles. Is that really just incentivizing wealthy people to have discounts on their vehicles? So um, I still think it was a great, it was a great bill and um, very well thought out. And I know Climate Air Task Force, which is a philanthropic uh, endeavor, helped guide that. So uh, good on all of them for getting that passed. So let me ask a follow-up question. So the Securities and Exchange Commission has put out a proposed rule. So we can all, everybody in this audience can go comment on it. And that rule requires companies to disclose their climate risks. Um, and so I'm wondering what you think of that too, because um, obviously some of Wall Street's fighting back and saying, you're getting in the way of 
capitalism. Um, but other people are, like myself, are really excited about the fact that you not just have to uh, tell the public what your climate risks are, because if we're going to invest in you, we need to know if you're going to go up, because uh, belly up if you're not doing it right. But you also have to, um, and this is probably also important for fashion, is uh, you also have to disclose every single one of your suppliers. So, and it could be thousands. So it's a complicated new rule, and I don't know if you've read much about it but, or what you think, but it is going to allow investors um, to gain a whole lot more information about what they're um, investing in. Yeah, I think uh, transparency is going to be good because uh, um, people people talk about greenwashing. So, obviously, actually having to show you know all those transactions of what the company is actually going to do. Um, as in, you know, people who are trying to become conscientious, conscientious uh, you know, impact investors, you want to know that they're actually going, you know, the, f the full mile f uh, in regards to that. But um, at the same time, I still think. It, it's more impactful to just, you know, as an example, like to give to give money to a u utility company like Next Air Energy that has a decarbonization plan versus giving to Exxon, who's showing that they're they've planted a couple more trees that year. You know, I think that it just has has more impact than that. But I still think the transparency and uh, regulation um, does, you know, make for yeah, it makes for a better future. Right. Okay, Doug. Okay, on on the fashion world, um, Earth Day happens to have a campaign in fashion and. It is pretty astonishing how little I knew, even though I've been in this business a while. I mean, there are billions of garments made. We're all wearing plastic. Our bloodstream is full of plastic. Our organs are now uh, full of plastic. And plastic doesn't just, um, when it breaks down into microplastics, doesn't just act as um, a bad actor. It's made out of oil, and I'm wearing it. Probably we're all wearing a little of it. Um, but it also attracts heavy metals. And so um, those heavy metals then end up in our fish, our food, our bloodstream, et cetera. Um, they're everywhere, even in bottled water and from the deepest places. So um, having somebody moving into the cotton industry, which itself, because of water and land, um, has always been um, an incredible product, incredibly useful, um, and without half of the problems that we have in plastic. So I'm wondering how in, what's the, tell us about what you're doing in terms of what you're making, how you're sourcing it, um, what the impacts are, and how you see this growing, um, given the concern w that we have with plastic. Yeah, <clears throat> no, it's a great question. And uh, actually, Colin referenced it, but greenwashing, one of the biggest things that we deal with in the uh, apparel industry, the fashion industry, is, is greenwashing. And um, it's really nice for a company like ours, Zenkai Sports, because we have the highest factory certifications. We are produced, we actually are giving back more to the power grid than we're taking. Um, this is uh, one of the ethos of our company and, and Zenkai being you know, derived from a Japanese philosophy of continuous improvement. Um, we're never done getting better. So for us, you know, you come out with something that's the big apparel brands and they'll say things, oh, this is recycled polyester. I'm like, well, the polyester is still in our world. So it's, you're still producing it, you're still making the plastic. So for us being cotton, being biodegradable, being 92% natural, being eco-friendly and sustainable, um, it's sometimes tough to get above that noise because all these brands are, are claiming to be sustainable when they're clearly not. Um, so the, you mentioned, Kathleen, with the role with government. So for us in the apparel industry is, is the workers, like when you have the highest factory certifications, the workers are taken care of, everything's good at the facilities, um, there's, there's nothing negative that's going on on that side of things. So that's what I'm excited to see is becoming the new norm. And people are recognizing now where our apparel, where is the co cotton being sourced from? Is it coming from the Uyghur province in China where some of the biggest brands in the world are coming, where they are still using child labor? So for us having that transparency in the world, it's us as a small brand, getting above the noise and getting people to educate. So for, for us, we almost see it, yes, we sell apparel and, and I'm not wearing oil, I'm wearing cotton. So it's kind of cool to be on the forefront of this change and how many people I talk about and talk to don't understand where their apparel comes from. And I didn't understand where it came from four years either. So there's no negative, there's no judge, judgment, but us being almost an education company in this space, because for 20 uh, years or so, you've just been given a shirt and not really questioned it. So for us, the government regulations are super important to make sure that you can't greenwash and just claim you're doing all these things without backing up with certifications, with governing bodies. Um, that's really important for us. 
Yeah, it was interesting today. Um, just happened to look, typed in recent green inventions, just in case I came up with anything. Uh, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal. Um, Patagonia, a company that has supported Earth Day for many moons, two of their most senior people, Yvonne Chouinard, who owns Patagonia, is a very good friend of Earth Days, and um, but they are have found themselves up against the wall because everything they make just about is out of oil. So today, in the Wall Street Journal reported that Samsung, but from an inventor who was not from Samsung, had gone to Samsung and found a technology that would filter microplastics out of the water. Because we're also going to see in the next 10 years, um, in addition to this insane growth of renewable energy, we are going to see regulations and change in that field. And it is an offshoot of the climate problem. It is um, made from oil. And sometimes I think because of the thousand year um, time it takes for breaking down plastics and the fact that it is impacting so the health of so many of us, um, that I think is as big a problem as climate change. So, um, but it is interesting that there are, you know, whenever necessity is the mother of invention. And so wherever you have a problem, American and global ingenuity is going to be there to come up with something. Um, and I have, not to switch entirely, but I have a couple of questions for you, um, <laughs> Joe, um, that I think are really important. Um, and right before uh, this panel, there was a panel for some of you that were still in the audience on renewable energy in general. So it's kind of appropriate that this question is, um, is a really great one to follow on up what they were saying. Um, how does the legacy energy infrastructure in the US and around the world need to change in order to accommodate a complete shift of how we generate and use electricity in the age of, and you're right, electrification of everything? Yep, that, that's, that's exactly what needs to be done. And, and the panel before us did, did talk about that. Um, we're going to need, because our entire energy system was built for highly controlled plants that would generate energy, put it out onto a grid, just in time use. It's good, you know, you go in and plug something into your wall, you know that electricity is always going to be there um, until it's not. And now you've got utility companies asking uh, uh, for concessions from their consumers. Um, hey, could you turn your heat down a little bit? Could you turn your air conditioning uh, down a little bit? Can you put on an, another coke? Can you do this or that? Why are they doing that? Because in this transition to green energy, the grid was not built for that. There's no control system out there. It takes 30 minutes to start a new, uh, to start a, a, a power plant. And if cloud cover comes over, you're going to lose 30 or 40% of your solar energy in a few seconds. And so, so battery technology, um, possibly modular nuclear, um, uh, all, all these different technologies are going to have to be needed because the entire infrastructure is going to have to change. Doreen Harris this morning was talking about putting up new transmission lines. That's great. That's going to be needed too. But that's a 10-year thing. It, that doesn't happen overnight. And so getting the power from offshore uh, wind uh, um, uh, turbines into New York City is not that that much trouble, but getting it to Cleveland is a big problem. And so uh, transmission, distribution, um, being able to have uh, an inventory of energy, as someone mentioned earlier, I think is really important. So our entire infrastructure is going to change drastically over the next 20 years. Yeah, it's still odd to me, I don't know. Uh, my great-grandfather invented underground cabling along with some other things, and I've never understood why they can't put our power lines in Europe or for any Europeans you know that they're building completely differently and there aren't power lines strung all over the place besides being ugly and they're vulnerable. About four years ago, I lost, I'm in Washington DC and I lost power for seven days, if you can imagine. We had to build a fire in the United States in the capital of the free world. There I was without, and the whole area around where I lived, seven days. Why? Because the power lines, they couldn't get them back up. There was so much snow. It was an old system. It's a very vulnerable grid. Yeah, very vulnerable grid. And it's, it's not okay. Um, it certainly isn't for the US and other countries are you know, getting religion, so to speak, and putting everything underground. So I don't know if it's a good idea to build them put new transmission power lines above ground, but I guess we'll see. Well, well just as a follow on to that, um, and, and this is what kind of comes back to our, our, our little turbine, which is actually powering the cauldron oh, down there. Oh, I saw that, that's great. Uh, yeah, that's our turbine uh, and, and solar rig. 
is that the need for that uh, the Department of Energy has come out with came out with a report that said there are 49 million places in the U.S. that could benefit from small wind. 49 million places to put small wind turbines, like our size or a little bit smaller, or a little bit bigger, um, anything like that, in conjunction with solar, uh, because we always say, as Ken said, wind and solar both. Um, but the fact that we need point of use energy instead of monolithic grid systems, monolithic plants, uh, creating tons of energy that's put out onto a grid that's highly controlled, that's part of the antiquated system. It's going to have to be small, distributed, mini grids, micro grids. Your house and your neighbor's house might be a nano grid, something like that, uh, where you know you've got power all the time. And it's not just an economic question either. This is. Um, people that are coming to us looking for turbines are looking for energy security, energy resiliency, uh, energy independence. They want to know, and a hedge against future rising energy prices. So they want to know that when I go over and plug that into the wall, I'm going to have power all the time. And now it's on me. It's not necessarily on a big utility. Yeah, it's extraordinary. Uh, this is a global event here, um, and we have athletes from around the world. And I looked at, I was at opening ceremonies last night and looked at all these countries. There are extraordinary number of countries. India, a place I have to go all the time, where we have 400 million people without a regular source of energy. So they're still investing in coal. They're still, they want to go green, but they also want to provide. Right. But to your point, now the Indian government's talking about nothing but these microgrids or local sources of energy because exactly. they don't they have the infrastructure, they've built power lines, but they just don't have the energy to transmit to it. So now they're rethinking the whole thing. And I think you'll see that um, in a lot of the developing world. If hope I'm hoping they don't make the same mistakes that we do. Um, so here's a question. Well, let me go back to um, ask you both a question um, about the role of athletes. Um, I personally find, in my organization, we end up talking to and meeting celebrities all the time. But in all the years I've been doing this, I have found athletes to be the most compelling. So um, with that admission, I don't know, how do you feel? What's the role? I mean, you're both involved in, in um, various organizations. And I know the speaker after um, our panel is also involved in. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the pressure you feel or your role or how athletes um, from every level um, who have so much to lose, particularly winter athletes, might play a role in helping us solve it. Because I do think kids everywhere, and certainly the Americans are in love with athletes. So maybe you could talk about your role and what you found in, in the years you've been doing this. Um, yeah, I mean, first I'm very grateful to be able to, that people want to put a mic in my face and I can actually <laughs> Uh, voice my opinion on the subject because uh, you know there is that kind of helpless feeling. I mean, you talked about the psychiatry that's needed. Um, you know, I'm glad I can speak on it versus throwing you know tomato soup at an oil painting or something like that. So, um, the um, so I'm grateful for this role. Um, and I don't know. I mean, yeah, everybody. People tend to look up to athletes, celebrities, sometimes in question. I, um, but I. I I think like, I don't want to take away maybe your talking point on veganism or something like that, but I know, <laughs> like, I, I know that people look to athletes and it was the documentary um, that athletes were uh, vegan and still performing and I think that it speaks to the validity of such a diet that the highest performing people are in fact eating that diet. So people look up um, in regards to that and then at the same time, um, yeah, just, just for people to um, stand up for for what they believe in. I think it can be misconstrued some time. I know that you know, when, like when LeBron LeBron speaks out, somebody tells him to keep dribbling a ball, so it can have negative connotations sometimes as well. Um, but um, to have the ability to have a voice, and if you do care about something, the ability, the fact that people actually want to hear what you have to say or will put you on a panel is pretty exciting. So get your, you know, put your ideas in the free market of ideas and see if it works. Yeah, and I think so too. We have a unique perspective, and you know, Colin and I obviously playing ice hockey or inside buildings. But you know, he, him growing up in Winnipeg and me in Vancouver, like we spent, like we train outside all all year round. Besides when you're playing, and obviously a lot of other winter athletes, winter sports are all outside. So I think it hits us a little bit differently. And growing up in the colder climate and seeing even just me myself being from Vancouver the last 10, 15 years, how much that's changed. So. Um, you know, to Colin's point, it's, it's always nice to, to be looked up to and um, I've never been 
a super vocal about anything I've ever done. I just go and do it. And, and if, if someone wants to, oh yeah, I'm going to cut, cut out meat and eat, eat more salad or I'm going to buy a, a cotton t-shirt for the first time, then that thing great. But I've never been a proponent to um, shove anything down anybody's throat. But for me, it's, uh, I mean, it's like, again, like the water bottle here, like I haven't bought a plastic water bottle in eight years. Um, I, I want to do my part as much as possible. And I think that's all you can do. And it gets daunting. And you wake up one day and like, well, like what the heck am I going to do, just one single person? But if, if the generations below us want to educate and everyone out here, like this is the future, then I think that's when the real change starts coming. And as an athlete, if someone wants to listen to us and put a mic in our faces, and if you change one person to eat less meat or drive an electric car or consume a, a cotton product that's better for the environment than a synthetic one, then, then that's, a, that's a win. Yeah, I mean, even Earth Day does huge events around the world, and uh, we have a program that's sort of parallel to what you're doing, which is Athletes for the Earth. And I've just found over and over again that the general public, um, maybe because we love sports and, and they're kind of, in many ways, I know I shouldn't say this because there are going to be a million caveats to it, are kind of above the fray. I mean, it's, it's your abilities against others' abilities, and it feels like it's just different than thrashing your way through business or through my job where we're always arguing about everything. And, um, and so we've had huge success, and I think I do think that the public really relates to uh, what's going on um, with athletes and their investments or their business. Um, let me ask Joe another question, um, but I, I think maybe this one you might all want to contribute to. Uh, the contrast and disparity of energy availability between developed nations and emerging nations is still stark, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, what will uh, need to change, happen to change this and uh, in a way that's consistent with global climate goals and supporting our environmental objectives? And if you could answer this, Joe, and then maybe you both could answer, how do you level the playing field um, um, for and not just and even in the United States with poor people. I mean, there are poor communities in Lake Placid. And how do you level the playing field so everybody gets to participate, have that kind of clean energy? And then for you, both of you, um, I'm sure you've played internationally and know what this is all about. So how do you feel we can level the playing field for all people? Well, okay, thank you. Um, as far as as far as leveling the playing field in the United States. Uh, it's been done a lot through incentives. Uh, I have solar panels on my house uh, because there was a great government incentive for me to put them on. If that incentive hadn't been there, I probably would still be weighing back and forth whether it was worthwhile to do that. I think there's going to have to be more incentives. The incentives for small wind, which is near and dear to my heart, um, kind of evaporated in the early 2000 teens because in the early 2000s, a lot of people made wind turbines that didn't work and they were they were junk and they put them out on the marketplace as opposed to one that's been engineered over, over you know, a period of eight to 10 years in one of the top engineering schools in the country. Um, and so the incentives have to come back. The incentives have to be not just for that, but for battery systems, um, for electric vehicles. Uh, those are things that are going to promote and guide people and, um, and help lure them into, uh, into better behaviors and into better purchases. Um, relating to the first, the first part, um, there's still a billion people on this planet with no access to electricity. So about an eighth of our entire world. Um, and that we would like to change. That is something that is, that is very dear to our heart. The mission of our company is to change lives and our environment simultaneously. And we can do that with, again, going back to microgrids, nanogrids, point of use electricity for villages in Africa or in, or in uh, South America. And we're talking to a lot of people like that, getting to the right NGOs and government systems and, or, or, and, and, and government people that can do this is a little bit difficult, but it's becoming easier because countries are now investing in sustainability offices and sustainability directors. And so they're, they're, they're turning an eye as, as the United States is kind of leading this effort along with Europe um, in order to not create a legacy infrastructure of transmission lines and huge plants, but of small, uh, small scale uh, energy uh, uh, development and generation and distribution at the local level. Thank you. What do you two think? Yeah, I think it's incredibly hard to tell 
an emerging market who's trying to get wealthy that no, you're not allowed to use what we just used to create the wealth in our country. So again, I guess it just comes down to human ingenuity, getting things like, you know, you can't just tell them you can only use solar panels and wind right now because of the intermittency of it if we don't have the long duration energy storage. So get the technologies there, get it cheaper so that these, you know, we want more people wealthy, we want more countries wealthy, so let's make sure we get our costs and the uh, economics right so that they are incentivized to use it because the incentives is, hey, you're going to save money and your margins are going to be larger, things are going to be cheaper, and that's good for everybody and we want, we want more people um, educated and wealthy, so. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm sure everyone's uh, heard of the term ESG, though, but environmental social governance. So a big thing in our industry is that now large corporations um, actually get tax credits or it helps their, um, uh, their, their ESG rating um, if they are doing sustainable um, good for the world. And that comes down to even what their employers are wearing. So we actually have a few um, of our investors um, working at major corporations now, them ordering our apparel that's environmentally friendly, sustainable, it actually helps their uh, ESG rating for their credit rating for their business. So for them, like this is, it's a win-win. So now all their employees are getting apparel. It's better for the environment. Some of those employees might have not been able to afford it or might not know that this is an option going forward. So for us, it's again, getting that message out and that education to level the playing field where you can have a product that's not gonna hurt the environment. And it's kind of nice when the co corporations and the governments get behind that because uh, it's the push down effect a little bit. So it's not us as a small company yelling and screaming like, care about the environment, like, but your money is your vote. So if you vote for synthetic, they're going to make more synthetics. If you vote for a cotton sustainable, we're going to make more cotton sustainable. So that's a, what's exciting for us is some of these larger organizations recognizing that buying a product from a company like ours, Zenkai, that um, it actually helps them uh, with their environment. By the way, can we buy clothes from Zentai? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Zentai.com. I, I got them in my trunk. We just come out there to the parking lot. Oh, bring it I'm some samples. I'm just I don't. Oh. But, oh. but, but fun fact, I was walking here with Colin today, and Colin said last time his Lake Placid, he knocked out his buddy's tooth in a hockey game. So far, I have my teeth. I mean, they're all fake, but so far, I've got my teeth. I've been with them for 24 hours, so I'm in good shape so far. A couple flying elbows, but I was falling on the sidewalks. But. Oh, that's hilarious. Okay, well, I'm going to ask you this, and you don't have to answer, but maybe you could tell the audience what we should be investing in, since you're an investor. I don't know. I have, Me? Really, okay. I have, I have really bad luck. I think I've, I've bought two for you. stocks on have, the stock market. We have a very small down. wind turbine company that should be... Yeah, yeah. Wait, yeah. wait a second, Joe. Wait a second. Wait a second. Yeah, Colin, we got to go. Him and donate to Earth. Yeah. Skipping that. No, I mean, what industries do you see are up and coming that... Uh, or tell us exactly what to buy. Yeah, no, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, so talking about the grid, so long duration energy storage, which, you know, like, uh, like Forum Energy is coming out with 100 hours, um, ESS is 12 hours, and EOS is uh, 12 hours again. This is zinc and iron, so people who worry about, you know, lithium and lithium mining, this actually takes care of that, which is pretty brilliant. I am a huge component, I love nuclear. Um, I know that it's, again, I would love to have somebody on here who could tell me the exact opposite. I think that the debate um, is one that needs to be had, but these new small uh, modular uh, units uh, that seem more safe, more economical, uh, less, less time to build, so that's incredibly exciting as well. Um, carbon capture is going to be a huge... It's going to be a huge one. Right now, again, the economics don't work. So um, that's why we should actually incentivize and tell big businesses um, to begin using those credits. So they're buying carbon credit. Essentially, they're using it to create a market for it. Um, and that's actually a very, very exciting um, realm as well. And then decarbonizing cement um, and steel, which people don't think about much, but it's going to be, I, I guess I'm not giving, a, I, I could give you another or a company, Sublime. Sublime's good. It's an MIT company. Um, and it, I mean, it's not publicly traded or anything like that, but these are the areas. I mean, they're the five hard to solve um, areas that we're going to have to, we have to give money to entrepreneurs. I'm not smart enough to do it. The people from MIT are, and they're figuring out nuclear fusion. That's going to be amazing. Um, but I mean, there's just, there's so many good companies and good people out there. Um, and they're, they're going to be the ones to figure it out. And it's the public sector and human ingenuity. And I will always bet on it, especially in the States. I'm half Canadian, so, but I will pump up America. <laughs> I was going to ask that question later on about the Canadian, but uh, we'll get back to that later. So Joe, from it, what, what do you think is the, 
I mean, I don't want to, the whole panel address before us address the nuclear issue. We don't have to get back into it. I do worry because I travel so much in um, the global south, as we now call it, as opposed to lesser developed countries. They change the name all the time to make it more palatable to people. But the, um, you know, it does worry me if you put up local nuclear plants or mini plants in some of these countries that don't have the trained staff to do them. And a lot of countries are talking about that, so it is a little nerve wracking. Wind is different. Um, so do you see, I mean, in all of the types of energy, I know fusion is still on the, you know, still on the drawing board, but more, I mean, it's an extraordinary process. I mean, hydrogen is an extraordinary process. Um, where do you see your company going in terms of growth and is, will it become 30% of the world's energy? What do you foresee down the road? Right now is, according to, uh, you know, the things that, that I can get online, um, wind is about 3% of the energy of the U.S. right now. That's a long way from 30%. Right. Um, and so that's an awful lot of wind turbines that are going to have to be put up. However, if you turn that equation around and you say we're going to put up a lot of small wind turbines instead of one big wind turbine, and we're going to put them in a lot of different places, then it becomes doable and it becomes something you can think through and say, I'm not going to need large wind turbines all the way from Long Island to South Carolina. I'm going to need them all over in these little places and you're not going to be able to see them because they're only 60 feet in the air as opposed to 750 feet in the air. And so it's going to be a lot more attractive and appealing to people. And so that's where we see our growth. We, we, never, we started this company thinking we're never going to be able to go around everybody's house and say, hey, want to buy a wind turbine and then put it up there. This is uh, the, the clients that we look for are commercial clients. So uh, think in terms of remote telecom or, or uh, small remote in, in, industrial power, uh, schools and colleges. Uh, we just sold three to uh, SUNY Canton, uh, three turbines there. Um, uh, parks uh, and uh, uh, U.S. Uh, parks and, and recreation where they have a building out in the middle of nowhere, out in the middle of Yellowstone or, or a, a park in Utah or something like that. Um, and e e EV charging stations are a great market for us. A level two charging station, two of our turbines can handle about 25 to 50 percent of the power requirements. That's de-stressing the grid. So these are the types of multiple turbine sale opportunities, including microgrids and nanogrids, that we are pursuing right now, as opposed to one-off sales. We'll always have one-off sales. We'll always be selling to a farm or a prepper or somebody like that, and that's great. We love to get our, our turbines out there any way we can, but we really want to put them, not just in this country, but in other countries to bring power to those who don't have it, who can't afford it, or are living without it after a natural disaster or something like that. And that's one of the reasons we built our portable trailer too, is uh, like a portable G G G Generac system <clears throat> that we could take into an area that has a flood or has a tornado and have immediate renewable power. Uh, of course, it has to be changed a little bit. We have to have higher turbines and we have to have more solar panels. But the battery system is actually pretty robust on that trailer, and that would handle quite a bit. Um, one other thing I want to say, this is about entrepreneurship. And um, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when I started my first company, there was no entrepreneurial ecosystem in New York State. None. There was, I, when I went to start a company, nobody knew how to do it. Nobody knew where to point you. There, were no, there was no funding. There was nothing. And so we kind of built that from scratch. I am part of the ecosystem in central New York and all of New York State. Um, and it's just amazing how it's grown and how much innovation you see from people making, you know, new types of apparel to new types of food to new types of farming to, to new types of energy systems and distribution. And, and I'm very, very heartened by the amount of investment and time and, uh, and, and emphasis that New York State and the country in general has put on entrepreneurship, especially with regard to climate change. Yeah, I mean, if I had my way, the whole government, we'd all be out there talking about how awesome this is because it is not just an opportunity to make money but create new professions and um, inspire the rest of the world. I, I'm a big, I know you're part Canadian, we'll skip that, but sort of like us. Um, but I do think the United States has a fantastic role to play in this and should be, we should be blowing our horn and we should be putting people like you on the stage all the time and talking about um, how this um, could provide income, not just for um, the people that always make the money, but for everybody 
in this room, in this town, and everywhere else around the world because it is, again, a time where we can reimagine everything. And speaking of that, my last question before I go to the audience, if there are questions, otherwise I have hundreds of questions for you, all three of you, um, is what do you think the role of individuals is? Um, I would call myself an imperfect environmentalist um, for sure. Um, I'm not a vegan. I drive my car. I'm attached to it. Um, and uh, we have lousy public transportation where I live anyway. Uh, but I do think individuals have a big role to play. Of course, I'm from Earth Day, I can say that, but, and we're the big tent. We have a lot of, when I say a big tent, Earth Day is for everybody, right? So we have a lot of strange people in our tent, and um, sometimes it's a real problem, but I do think this is not a subject that should be controversial. I think it's a subject that should be super exciting and, um, you know, like looking into, like a space race. I don't know how you feel, what, our role is individually from voting to buying to investing um, and what areas um, you'd like help with. I'll go. Um, so yeah, you just said really quickly, uh, voting. Yeah, you, you, I mean, you really should be voting and you should be pressuring or your politician into you know, supporting uh, climate, you know, climate initiatives. As an individual, it's really hard. And like, I'm, I know I made the joke about the tomato soup at the painting, but I kind of, I feel their angst where you're just like, you feel like there's only so much the individual can do and it is really hard. So it really is a cultural shift um, where we care more about the environment and it's happening. And you also do that through personal education. So if you're an individual, I'm glad that there was a panel up here telling you how to talk about it because to, for people to actually understand it, because you know, I'll talk to my, my friends who are like, oh, you drive an EV, it's worse than a Hummer. And I, you, know, you have to go through all the talking points again. Um, so as an individual, be educated, be able to talk to people. And I actually would say, I think culturally there should actually be a shift in the way that we consume meat. Um, I, now I've gone to you know, like a couple of days a week eating vegetarian after absolutely hoofing steaks my whole life. And um, so I think that, but I think that that actually is a cultural shift that can happen and I'm not gonna shame anybody for making, for eating a, a steak. I think it's one that could just happen and um, it, it is happening and one that uh, behaviorally we can change. Well, before, before you go, I just want to, uh, in DC they brought in lab grown meat, which doesn't sound very appealing. However, I tried it and I swear I could not tell the difference. I mean, I'm not a meat eater, so, but that tasted like steak. So if they can, it sounds disgusting and it's weird, but a lot of things sound weird. Just to tell you, my great grandparents were from Iowa and my mom used to tell me this, that when they brought indoor plumbing to Melrose, Iowa, the tiniest little town in Iowa, um, they, the city officials came in or the locals came in and we said, we're gonna move your outhouse into your house. And my great grandparents were completely horrified. What a disgusting concept. So um, you can get over that, and maybe we'll all be eating lab grow meat. But anyway, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, getting back to the individual, um, it sometimes sounds like a daunting thing, but I think it just little things equal big things, and small might seem like insignificant changes over time, you know, yield large results. So whether it's like even, again, getting onto the, the apparel side for us, it's like maybe you own less clothes, but the clothes are better quality. Um, so, you, you know, you hear the m minimalistic living and the tiny living and things like that. And I think we're past that idea of the McMansions. You have to have more and more and more things. So as an individual, there's, I mean, we what I mean, make 30,000 decisions a day. Like every decision you make, it's just it's like, insane. it's insane. So it's like a little bit overload for, uh, or overload load for everybody so you know whether you're having less outfits whether you're consuming less products um, whether you're walking more taking um, less cars like all those things add up and so I think as individuals you just got to find your thing and I, like we're all imperfect I'm an imperfect entrepreneur if we had to sit up here about the mistakes I've made as an entrepreneur like it's just every day you're making mistakes and you're learning from them so I think for us as individuals like you can't be hard on everybody you know, if someone has a stake, someone doesn't have a stake, it doesn't really matter. Everyone's got to live their lives. But if you can wake up every day and like, oh, like, I'm going to make one decision different or, you know, what's the, 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 the movie we watched this morning saying that the Earth is everything that we share. And it's true. Like, it's the one thing on the planet we're all a part of. And if you can pick up trash because you were walking in a park and you just see it, like, just anything like that, I think, helps. And if everyone has that mindset, I think we're all going to be better off. Yeah, it just... Uh and just to leapfrog off what I said earlier as far as what the individual can do, 
the entrepreneurial ecosystem um, has spawned kind of a new vision. Uh, people look at problems now and they think of new solutions. Hey, I could do that. Hey, I could do that. We could do it like this. It would be, it would be better if we did it like this. And then it spawned shows like Shark Tank and things like that, which isn't the real world. Of course, any entrepreneur or investor knows that. <laughs> but, but, it's, uh, but it does get people thinking, I'm going to look at the world differently. I'm going to look at it and see a problem and see a better way of doing something and then think about it and then either talk to somebody about it or maybe I'll do it myself. And that is an age of innovation and an age of, of, um, of, of new companies and startups and new technologies that are going to change our lives. Yeah, I know even uh, at, we're, one of our little projects we just started is trying to get, I've run marathons and long distance racing, races and you know, when you're running you're not thinking and you're grabbing those plastic cups and tossing them. But when I stopped doing that, I became really annoyed seeing plastics all over, like the canal in Washington, D.C. So we started a little campaign to get the marathons of the world and the 10Ks and all the runners to stop using plastics. I've been, the um, London Marathon finally stopped using them, but I've been amazed at how difficult it is to get people, not because the product doesn't exist, because they're just used to doing stuff the same way over and over again. I'll give you one other example, which is, there are, in the United States, believe it or not, what are we, 330 million people, more or less? Um, about 100 million people in the U.S. Um, do cleanups. Earth Day does cleanups, till the, and we're just doing cleanups all the time. I mean, that's what people do for Earth Day often. But getting them to take the next step and maybe sign a petition to get rid of plastics in their community or maybe put pressure on the U.S. government to take a lead role. There's a new plastics treaty that was just introduced uh, in a meeting. And within three years, we're gonna have a global uh, agreement on plastics. Love your help with that. Um, but uh, we have a new idea to get everybody who does cleanups, who are sick of cleaning up plastic in their communities, along with other things, cigarette butts, um, to sign on to treaties and to sign on to petitions so that we can push the US government, which by the way, is standing in the way of the plastics treaty. It's extraordinary, it's Saudi Arabia and the US blocking everything. Uh, go figure. I, go figure. Um, but in any event, so getting 100 million or some portion of those individuals to do something, um, you know, would be great because they're the ones out there picking up the stuff. So if any of you are interested in signing up or looking for a way to participate in the plastics treaty, it's as big as the climate agreement. Okay, I don't know how much time we have left, probably seconds. Okay, perfect. All right, so. Thank you. We'd love to hear from you on any subject, related or unrelated. There's one in the back. By the way, I heard your question before at the last panel. It was really good. Can't wait to hear this one. Yeah, it was really good, this guy. Well, first of all, thank you for the panel, and thank you for, A, your contributions, your work, and also your entrepreneurial leadership. And... But it's more of a little bit of a comment. So you, the thing is, is that priorities and what we focus on. You mentioned about the 100 million people in plastics. But the biggest source that makes money off it from the entrepreneurial angle, angle is what? The petrochemical industry. The petrochemical se sector that gets a lot of government subsidy. And they pay into a huge lobbying you know, effort that, as they say, that gets into the disinformation. I think the critical point is how do we best and efficiently use that place? And I would encourage you and I like you speak more to the democracy because the issue is how do people vote their values to bring about that change and I just think that that is going to be a more significant call to action uh, than you know definitely the personal choices but that's in, often in the vacuum of the mythology of people demonizing the environmental movement because they again it's a right wing talking point is oh your carbon footprint well, I tell a lot of people who criticize, well, didn't you fly to New York? I go, yes, it's a regularly scheduled flight. And I also take regularly scheduled uh, trains. So my, you have what they call constant transportation. If you look at plane schedules, that is already there. It's not at the negation or contradiction of the carbon movement. I want cleaner transportation. But that said, knowing when to walk away from a trolling point or not feeding a troll by gauging in conversation that people think that this is a solution or that it's a real decision when we really need to have a deep conversation on climate and climate action. So to the extent that how do we shape our democracy and get voters to really vote their values versus those who are trolling us about what is a good environmentalist. 
Um, anybody want to comment on that? Thanks, brother. Yeah, and I, I think um, the biggest thing we can do is, uh, is your money is your vote as well. So you're voting for if you're taking public transit or you're buying a bicycle or you're doing something like that. So I think the biggest thing that, you know, with it's the meat industry or whatever, for a lot of years, I, I, did, I haven't been eating for eight years, and I didn't want to put my vote with my dollars into more meat. So I hope one day that I wake up and actually I take credit for bringing first almond milk to Starbucks in Portland because oh. I asked for non-soy milk every day for about two years. <laughs> I made a point every day I walked into Starbucks, I said, can I have some almond milk? They said, sorry, I don't sell it. I'm like, okay, next day, every day. They knew what I was going to ask every single time. And sure enough, one day they had almond milk. So you're in welcome. Portland of all you're welcome. <laughs> Took them but long enough. That, it's the Republic of Portland. Right. I don't know. So the gentleman's point is absolutely is is put your money where your vote is, and and us as individuals, and it's it's voting for whatever it is you're you're passionate about. Yeah, I I you want to go. Yeah, no, you got it. <laughs> okay, I was, I was just going to say quickly, one of the things we do in business is that we have to um, we have to make the welfare of the company and the welfare of our customers and our employees and our investors all congruent so that everybody wins at the same time and not at the expense of one of those groups of stakeholders. And so I think making, uh, personalizing it and bringing the welfare of our country, of our environment, uh, of winter sports um, to a point of being personally relatable to somebody is the important thing to do. I'm not an expert in how to do that, but that's what needs to be done because that's how we run businesses, successful businesses run like that. Yeah, and I was certainly brought to the precipice of insanity due to what you're describing. And um, it is what led me to investing is exactly what you are describing where I want to live a modern life and everybody does. You know, I want to take a flight to go see my parents back home in Winnipeg and not feel guilty about it. And you, you spoke to, you know, plastics and petroleum. And again, this is where you have to go to innovation. Um, you know, we're switching to electric cars because we want to, but because... Elon Musk, which I know he's controversial, whatever, I love him, and he, he created an electric car people wanted and brought to the market and that uh, performs better and we could do the same for plastics and it's very hard because of this lobbying and there's a lot of wins against this and this is the dark side of capitalism is that you have those lobbyists and uh, people holding these things back but that's where you know, we can begin propping up these other entrepreneurs and companies to compete with them and produce a better product so instead of plastics we have a biodegradable one that's actually cheaper and people just buy it. Um, any other questions from the audience? No? Well, thank you very much for being here, all of you and all of you. It was really great and nice meeting you all. And um, we'll be here for a few minutes for sure if anybody has any questions. Thank you. Fantastic. Once again, let's thank everybody here. Great panel discussion. Kathleen Rogers, thank you so much. Great job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Great to meet you. Thank you so much.